All right, guys, I want to welcome everybody back. It is Tuesday, 7 o'clock Central, another conversation with Commodores. And we have, and I've, I've only done this a couple of times, but I'm so glad that we're doing it tonight. It is part two with Dwayne Jones, manager, equipment extraordinaire. Dwayne, how are you doing tonight, bud? Doing great, Bernard. Great to see you. You First too. off, congratulations to you and the rest of Braves Nation on a fun, fun World Series and a couple of Mandy guys getting a ring, too. That was super, super fun. Oh, and, uh, so you know, Luke, Luke is over the moon. Luke Wyatt always over the moon. He's mm -hmm. lifetime braver, too. So it's been a great, great uh, base end to baseball season. And then hearing that Kevin Stallings' son got the Golden Glove Award as a catcher was amazing. Wow. And then Brian Reynolds, a bandy boy, getting named a silver slugger from the Pirates. Had the had he not been for anybody for the Pirate or played for anyone but the Pirates, mm -hmm. I think he would have been in the MVP running. So, yeah, yeah, good, good, uh, good little ending for Vanderbilt baseball there. But uh, but we're here to talk football. So <laughs> let's we get are into guys. It. I guess it was uh, it's been a month or three since Dwayne and I had our first conversation. And I posted a link to it in the promo for today, and I'll do it again. But with Dwayne's and his family's longtime connection with the school, with the athletic department, with all sports, I just, we ran out of time. And we could probably do parts three and four and five if we really, oh. really need and want to. But may, down the road, we may have to. That's right. That's right. But we're now, what, nine games into the season. We've got to finish up strong. Hopefully, we'll snag a win or two out of this. And, and uh, for what I'm seeing, I'm seeing improvement. I know we've got injuries, but you have injuries every year. We're seeing dual quarterback play. A lot of single guys are, are, are doing well. Um, and, and I'm still very optimistic. We, this is a, a build. This is not a, a rush. And, and one of those, so we've got some folks who've already popped in that want to see D. Wayne, uh, Jim Arnold, Gerald Collins, Jeff Madden, some legends. That's a strong start, starting group right there. And then there's Kenny Cole. No, I'm kidding, Kenny. Thanks for dropping Kenny is in. awesome. But uh, we've got some of our regulars, and I always love seeing how many folks – stop in and uh, thank you guys for keep coming back on Tuesdays. I know we've been switching around a little bit. Schedule's been crazy, but we try to do this every week. And just as a side note, I'll repost, but we've got them all the way through the end of this year. And I'm starting to look into January. So keep coming back. we got some big names who are coming and I'm working on getting the chancellor sometime in January. So I'm looking forward to it. Oh, wow. To that as, as is the well. sitting chancellor or Joe B. Wyatt? Let me just clarify. No, the sitting chancellor. All right. And I want to welcome also oh, one of our buddies, OJ Fleming, has just dropped in. OJ, good to see you, buddy. Or here. I mean, I want to I want to stay off the field. I want to go into the equipment room. I want you to set the tone right. when you and Luke first started out. Kelly is in, I don't know if he's in his prime or if he was ever in his prime. Maybe he was always in his prime. <laughs> but the life of an equipment manager is not well known. You, you're not, you're no, not ever in the headlines unless you screw up. You're not ever. Yeah. Hey, that's out the by last the thing. If you, if you, yeah. If you, you hear the word manager, up. so you something screwed up. So yep. when you don't hear it, that's when you know you've done your job. You know, before we, in our previous conversation, you talked about high school, a little bit of the transition to coming to school, your mom family members and you in playing high school sports but you wanted to stay involved with high school sports I mean with college sports and so that led you to coming to Magoogan so take us to that time and then come forward a little bit because the life of an equipment manager or a trainer they're they're just it's unsung to me they're unsung heroes that's part of the glue that holds any sports program together well, I was fortunate enough that when I started, it was also Luke's first year. So we kind of got to break each other in and, uh, you know, became, you know, we're still we're now probably one of my closest friends I have. But 
the way our year started, we would come in about two weeks before the freshmen reported and start getting equipment ready, sleds ready, helmets ready, um, you know, putting face masks on helmets because every, I don't know if players knew, realize this or not, but every year your shoulder pads and the helmets were sent off for reconditioning and certification to make sure they were up to standards. And the existing players, we knew what type of face mask they put on or would wear, so we would put those on. But my first couple of years, you know, the budget, you know, was always really tight at Vanderbilt. And so one of the innovative ways that Kelly found to save some money was we got, we, when we switched to Nike, we got Nike shoes, but we got Nike surplus shoes. So we had Nike shoes with green swooshes, orange swooshes, red swooshes, blue swooshes. So we had to sit down with every pair of Nikes with a Sharpie blacking in the swoosh, blacking in the back. And then we had a stencil to put Nike on the back on every pair of shoes. So that we literally spent about a week for, for two years doing that before the guys reported to camp. And that was almost the always most dreaded thing in the world to do that. But I guess that's where I learned that, that helped in my aid in becoming a dentist of having the, the hand to be able to type right in Nike on the back of a shoe for 200 pairs of shoes. Then, not to mention the sheer patience of, of doing this hours upon hours and hundreds of pairs of shoes. Oh yeah. You know, they, we had great to do for the grass shoes and turf shoes. So yeah, it was 200, 250 pairs of shoes. We had to do that with, and we did it for at least two seasons before we finally got black legit, our own Nike shoes. So that was just one of the ways that, you know, we tried to stretch dollars as best we could to provide the best equipment we could for the guys. And then once we got that ready, then we started getting field equipment ready. I mean, one of the hottest days of my life, Luke and I are in the end zone. Uh, matter of fact, the end zone behind your shoulder and your screen there on a day, it's about 105 and we're putting together, I'm sure some of the linemen were at the offensive and defensive remind them will remember at the, seven man sled and it's you know it weighed about uh, probably two thousand pounds all told so we had to you know unbox it take it apart put it together and then you know load it onto a truck to take it over to the practice area mm -hmm. matter of fact I'm talking about practice our my freshman year we actually did two a days in the outfield of the baseball field oh because uh, the intramural fields were under some construction and we weren't able to access them yet. So we actually did two a days for about a month in the outfield of uh, baseball. I'm, I don't think imagine, Corbin would allow that now. I was going to say, could you imagine on that field, on that turf now? I don't think so. <laughs> uh, Dwayne, we got some folks. Uh-oh, Linda must have shut the restaurant down or got tired of Coach. She must have kicked him out. We got Coach Shepard is with us. And, uh, and Billy Smith has joined and he says that he used to help in waxing the helmets. And I wanted to yes. ask you about the helmets. When a helmet would come in and you've got to prepare it, let's say it doesn't have a face mask on it, but it's been certified. Well, does the face mask require as part of the certification or, or not? No, the helmet comes with no face mask on it back from certification. And then you mounted, you know, whatever, you know, say your, your style face mask for the quarterback mask, we would put those on, the linemen put those on. And then when the freshmen came in and Kelly and Luke fitted them, then we put on whatever position-wise face mask they required. But, you know, you had, after you'd done that a few hundred times, you got to where you were pretty quick and efficient with that. Well, I was, I was going to say, I don't know how it is now, but back in the day, we only had one helmet. Yeah, game and, and, and that was, you know, Thursday night before game night. That's what Billy was talking about, waxing the helmets. Like I said, we only had one helmet. So um, depending on what year, whether it was a white helmet, a black helmet, or a gold helmet, um, the gold helmets were the only exception where we had to paint uh, to clean up the others. But we literally striped the helmets each week, stripped them down. And as Billy said, we did wax them you know to get a nice clean shine but we were a lot smarter than ut we didn't use the wrong kind of wax to where it turns beige by the end of the year uh, and and Dwayne, when you had to put on a mask when you had to put on all the striping or whatever it was for that particular helmet how long did it take per helmet to prepare it 
once it came back from certification? Um, you know, it'd take you about five, 10 minutes to put the mask on, get all the uh, straps secured, and then to put on the chin straps, get that buckled in. And then we actually didn't start striping them until closer to game, game time or game weeks. Um, cause we practiced with, uh, if we had, before we had, when we had stripes and elaborate things, we waited and did that until closer to season started. But Thursday night was a long night. You had, you know, we dressed depending on home or road, you know, 70 to 85. So every helmet was restriped, uh, relogoed. So, you know, that was about a five or six hour night. And then every pair of shoulder pads, you put double laces on to make sure there's no breakage there. You're checking helmets for broken buckles on, you know, anything like that, tightening the screws on all the things just so that, you know, we were, depth was always an issue. So we didn't want everyone an equipment issue to be the reason that a guy missed a play or a snap. And, and one of the things that, that, that outsiders or even some of the ball players never knew is what you guys did in the cage during all of those hours. We only would see you guys during the times we were at, McGugan practicing, getting ready for whatever we were doing. We would interact with you for a minute or two because you always were busy. What folks never saw is what you're describing now. It's all, the, I'm going to call it the grunt hours or the grunt work, if you will. And I don't mean a disrespectful, it's just oh, no, the that, hard that was... grind of that, of that job. Now, it can be monotonous. It can be boring. But how did you guys make it not boring? How did you put some fun into what you were doing? You know, to me, it was, you know, the old saying, look good, feel good, I guess. Deion Sanders was one that came out with that several years ago. But, you know, I wanted our uniforms and our helmets to be, you know, look sharp, be, be in the line of, you know, because a television game or, or not, you know, you wanted it to be the best looking helmets and uniforms that we ever had. Matter of fact, the, the blackout uniforms that they're going to wear Saturday night are very similar to ones that we wore. Um, I believe it was whether Watson senior year or Donardo's first year. The black with the plain gold number. You yeah, there's actually all times. If you guys look at one of Mike Healy's photos, and I think it's the one I used for his cover photo for his on YouTube, it's that jersey, that uniform. It's very plain, but it to me, it's it's because it's, of how simple it is, it's very sharp. Oh, that was one of my, that was probably my favorite uniform during my whole tenure there, just because it, like you said, it wasn't ornate or overdone. It was just very classy looking and, you know, stood out. The numbers stood out, the name on the name on the back of the plate popped. You know, it's almost, except for the name on the back, it's almost a throwback of the old jerseys from decades and decades ago when everything was just, just straightforward, plain, simple. And you knew by the color yeah, scheme you of could the get. uniform who it was. Exactly. Yeah. Or the logo so, on the helmet. Statute of limitations is is over for anything you're about to share with us. <laughs> I need a Luke story. I need a Tyler story. I need a Lee Van Dyke story. We want to hear some of the stuff that hadn't been told. Life in the equipment room. Actually, one of the well, we had um, our freshman year, we had we played intramural flag football. Mm -hmm. And on the, we kind of stacked the team a little bit. We had Brent Young was one of our managers and had an absolute cannon for an arm. So he was our quarterback. And then, of course, Lee Van Dyke and I played and uh, Luke played, but we brought in some ringers. We brought in Brad Bates, Joel Blunk, and uh, – <laughs> A couple These of are men. Days. These are grown men. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, we just we dusted everybody in intramurals that year. And I was like, "No, that's not fair." You had a four time, you had a a walk on starter safety at Michigan, a Rose Bowl player as one of your intramural players. That's not fair. <laughs> hey, we never practiced the the fraternities. We you know were practicing two or three times a week. We just showed up on game night and played and let it fly literally drawing up plays in the dirt. You know, it's so funny you bring that up. In law school, I had a, an intramural team, and there were four of us who played uh, different levels of college ball, and they never 
Well, they found out soon enough, but that was, yeah, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> didn't take long. <laughs> we did the same thing in dental school. Uh, Jody had uh, Derek Payne and himself in his class and another guy that played college ball. So needless to say, they wiped everybody out in the first <laughs> game. And of course, you know, we're playing flag and my brother, you know, pretty aggressive guy, you know, he gets on the field and he goes into football mode and the first play of the game, instead of coming up and just, you know, grabbing the guy's flag. I mean, he squares him up, wraps him up and drives him to the ground. And he almost, <laughs> got, kicked out, almost got kicked out of the thing. And he's just like, man, I'm sorry. He said, I played in college. He said, it's the first time I've been back on the field. He said, you know, that, that was just instinct kicking in, but uh, Jody said, yeah, they, they won, they won uh, <laughs> yeah, he was, he was a pretty, <laughs> then you want to run a little toss, toss sweep to, Derek Payne, and I promised you nobody was going to catch him once he got yeah. past the line of scrimmage. If, if that's a patient, go ahead and take it. We'll come back. No, no, it's it's my <laughs> daughter's computer. I'm, well, guys, I got I'm, somebody covering call for a little while. I'm talking yeah, but, but uh, yeah. others, some uh -huh. uh, Tyler, and then one one other manager. He was that manager trainer. Wade Pretty, I want to send a special shout out to him with Veterans Day coming up Thursday. I'm um, not sure if many of you knew this, but uh, Wade ended up joining the United States Marine Corps and just recently retired as a lieutenant colonel. Mm. And he was a physical freak of nature. He could run a marathon. He could bench press 225 for reps, but just an incredible, incredible athlete. And then, but, you know, to go on and he went to Texas A&M, got his master's, and then joined the Marine Corps and spent a, an illustrious career. And having worked with a lot of military to get to the rank of lieutenant colonel in the Marines is no easy feat. That's fantastic. And to, to Wade and any, as I put in the post earlier today, and I hope others see it and will recognize either themselves or other Commodores who've served. You're right. With Thursday being Veterans Day, there's never enough recognition there's never enough thanks for their sacrifice for all so thank you for thank you billy that. smith i know i don't know you're, if you're still on mm -hmm. absolutely billy served in vietnam so and i know that's something he's very proud of and proud of him for it thank you billy and, and any others who we may mention tonight or, or have inadvertently not mentioned because i know there's got to be many in this group who have at one time or another served but let's, let's get back. Let's talk about Tyler. Let's talk about that 87, 88, 89 time period. We didn't win a lot of games, but you guys sure had a lot of fun. Oh, that was uh, – uh, we were we, – uh, Tyler, Tyler and, and you and I and several others were running mates. I mean, we had the infamous uh, spring training trip to uh, – Scotty Madison hooked us up with tickets to go to ball games, and we – pile in my two-seat RX-7 and drive to Florida spring training and caught some amazing games. I think in one day we saw Sabre Hagen, Old Can Boyd, Nolan Ryan, and Roger Clemens all pitch in one day. So that was, to me, a, a, day. <laughs> a, a highlight of, of a day in baseball there to see that much talent all in one day in spring training. But, you know, just little trips like that that we took with, you know, that was one of the few – that was probably the only spring training trip I took um, or spring break tra trip, I should say. But that was that was a lot of fun and great memories made there. But, yeah, Tyler was my running buddy. He, he was the king of ball spotting during practice. Nobody got the ball. I mean, players hated him because he would – he would have the ball ready for the next play so fast, you know, because he had – we had the scripts for the practice. So, as soon as – the next, as soon as the first play is blown dead, he's already got the ball set on whatever hash or yard line for the next one. And there'll never be anybody that could set the ball as quick as Wade did. Oh, I had guys in the huddle Not say, Wade go Tyler's tell your boy, me. go tell your boy to slow it down. Yeah. Like, Y'all got to talk. That's not me. I'm not getting involved in any of that. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was, he was a man on a mission when it came to practice and getting that ball spotted. But, you know, Tyler was a great athlete himself. Uh, you know, he could, he could sling it and he could catch it. And that was, you know, one of, one of the other things that we did a lot of as managers that he and I both enjoyed was, you know, if quarterbacks or receivers wanted to go out and 
mm-hmm. throw balls, catch balls, run routes, you know, let's throw them. You know, we always went out before practice. Or we were already out there for about an hour beforehand, but anybody that came out early and wanted balls thrown or balls caught, we did that. And we enjoyed that as much as, you know, doing it as they did, you know, getting reps in. It was, you know, fun for us because Tyler was just like me. You know, he loves sports. He's competitive. He wanted to be part of the team and contribute. And he was just as competitive as anybody on anybody that put on a helmet. I'll promise you that. And I know he'll watch this sometime this week, but I think he was just as equally excited not to be still part of the ROTC program. And yeah. as he was part of the, the football program. Uh, yeah, we we definitely <laughs> we stole one from the military there. That's right. We That's got a right. we got a first round draft pick there, but I think we had to pay back on that one. That's right. Well, guys, I'm talking with Dwayne Jones, who was a, a manager, but so much more, and his family's been so involved with Vanderbilt sports for decades. We this is our second round of of conversation, and we're just we're just kind of running through some some history and some things that that bring thoughts to to mind. And here's what I want to ask you. Dwayne, my, my comment is you and I both know that the, the stadium has been largely voted for the last 20 plus years as, as the worst in the SEC from a facility standpoint and maybe nation, one of yeah. the five worst in the nation. But it was built, the new stadium was built in 1922 and then it was added on in 81 and a couple other times, I think most recently in 81. And I know at least we've heard a little bit about the changes that are coming between the stadium on Jess Neely's side up to McGugan. I don't know exactly what that looks like. I don't know if that's all been put out, but here's, here's I don't don't know if they have a firm plan yet. Um, I think it's just been alluded to. Right. Here's my question to you. Yeah. It's an intimate stadium, 41 or so thousand. It's rarely filled with Vanderbilt people or rarely filled to the max with, with any games. But what was it about that stadium that you actually have enjoyed or did like? There's something to be said for a smaller stadium as opposed to these just mega stadiums throughout the South and, and other big it's, programs. It's funny you should mention that. I don't know if it was you that posted the link to a YouTube video or not, but uh, somebody had posted a link to the YouTube video of the – 2012 UT Vandy football game Mm -hmm. and it was a night game and there was not an empty seat in the stadium the -hmm. crowd was loud they were boisterous they were into it of course as we started pulling away later in the second half they got even more loud and boisterous and you know and and it was a lot less orange as the game absolutely absolutely (laughs) yeah they well there was a lot of showing of clips of them leaving at halftime yeah yeah but I've since gone back and watched clips of, you know, the Ole Miss game, the Kentucky game, some of those others. And, you know, it was, you know, that's just eight or nine years ago that we had completely packed and it was, you know, 80% Vanderbilt. So I, I do think we can get back. It's not going to be a quick, easy thing. This is definitely going to be a marathon to get us there, not a sprint. Um, we didn't get this far behind. Uh, you know, overnight, although it seems like the explosion that some of these schools are spending on their facilities is unreal, but just like watching the Alabama game the other night, I mean, that light display they have was more so than anything I've seen even in NFL stadiums, so that's that's kind of hard to top. You know, it's it's all, but it's all part of the arms race, and, and part oh, of yeah. that, and this is a different topic for another day, technology really puts – and technology and just the desire to stay home with such great technology, no crowds, don't have to wait in line for the bathroom, don't have to, you know, fight off COVID issues. Stadiums for any sports, I think, fight that these days. And that's why they've yeah, got to have light all shows. sports, all, you know, yeah. baseball, basketball. The only one I think that's not as affected is – hockey just because hockey does not translate to television like it does live but the other three sports I think all definitely suffer from the change in technology you know we've all got 70 inch tv screens or Luke's got an 85 so that's where I go to watch the ball games yeah hey uh, you know so 
holler at me. <laughs> but so you're yeah, right. I think that plays a big role in it. You yeah. know, you can stay at home and you got to, you, you feel, you feel like you're right at the game, but you know, there's part of being, especially college as opposed to the pros of the atmosphere of being on campus. And granted, you know, I, we're, we're lacking in that, but you know, the things that they're doing and having in the works, you know, I think are going to help bring people back into the pregame and tailgating and bring that back. And that's the one thing that television can never replace. I know like when the uh, ESPN crew came into the campus for the first time during Bobby Johnson's era when we had uh, – we're playing Auburn that night. Well, I, I remember that, that was, game well. That was an amazing experience, you know, and that's that's not something that you can – experience or even get a feel for on watching television you know you got to be there in it to experience it well Dwayne take us to a game what a game day what made it exciting for you what what kept you awake thinking about the next day what we were going to do or what you had to do because you guys were there long before us you were there long after we were gone but you also had during the game lots of re uh, responsibilities you were on the the uh the headsets you had yeah, the, the number you one thing football. during the game was at least as far as the student managers was you know was it was pre that was the pre cordless headset so everybody had a cord so you had eight or nine assistants with cords so that's where managers were stepping in the keystone cops were carrying lines you know everybody everybody had a coach and tyler had a coach too so you know, that was, that was a hard, you know, during a game, you know, that's, you're concentrating on your, you're not, you're giving your coach enough room and you're still hopefully getting to watch a little bit of the game as you go along, but, you know, not getting caught up in the chain gang. And, but, you know, thankfully I was with Watson most of the time, coach Brown. So he usually stayed right up on the sideline rather than going back to the bench and talking to players like some of the position coaches had to. So I had the luxury of being, you know, on the front row, so to speak, most of the time, rather than having to thread around through players and equipment boxes and trunks. So, but yeah, that was, during the game, that was our main responsibility. But pregame, it was to come out, you know, set up all the trunks with all the equipment, the extra shoes, and then you know, help the trainers set up the uh, tables for, and, uh, and, and they, well, the trainers pretty much handled the Gatorade and all that, but in the cart, but you know, we had all the equipment that you you have to have to play the game. And of course the game balls. And then we had uh coach if Coach Sheppy's still on Rambo was probably the all-time best uh ball runner we ever had and he was pretty good at stealing signals too. So uh <laughs> he would uh he could he would signal run or pass yeah. as often as he could uh interpret it. And there was one game we were playing at Ohio State and I don't know how I ended up running balls that game but the second half the head coach comes up to me and says hey you need to go over to your sidelines you got to leave I'm like well for what he said you're stealing signs I said coach if I'm stealing signs I'm the worst there is I said we're down 10 points so you probably want me to stay but uh so he kind of chuckled and let me stay on the sideline of the opponent's sideline so I ran balls that game and uh I'll defend Tom Brady here the balls do get deflated during a game, you know, especially when we had EJ, you know, if we get into a game where we're going to, it's messy, messy and wet, you know, those, those things got down to where they're pretty soft. So you could uh, not worry about fumbles or, and then, you know, if we knew a pass play is coming in, we had a bag of more inflated balls. So we made sure we rotated those in. So I will, I will defend Tom Brady's honor that, the guys on the carrying the balls definitely always had an air needle in a pocket in their pocket. You know, the other thing you guys were also the precursors to the current version of the get back coach. Yeah. How often we had to get everybody back just to keep the lines clear. So we how were, often we were, were you having we were the first line of defense? Oh, uh, there were there were many times I had to pull literally pull him back, mm -hmm. you know, when uh I you know, even I wish we had instant replay back in the day during that era because there were two or three games where we, you know, we were when we were four and seven, you know, just one or two calls that go the wrong way. Had they had the chance to go back and look at them, you know, I think we would have won two or three more games with instant replay back in that day. Yeah. And that's 
one of the well technology catching up but that was a real frustration when you look back now and said man we could, they could have gone back and fixed that they should have they definitely should have called that face mask on the sideline where Corey Harris gets, catches a ball but just falls short of the four, four, first down but gets obviously pulled down by the face mask and there's you know no flag to be seen so you know those replay would have helped us a lot back then all right I'm going to throw some games at you and I want to get some memory recollection from you Rutgers Meadowlands 1988 I believe last play or almost the last play of the game they line up for a long field goal what happens thankfully they missed it and probably and the, due the, to play, the, the play that set it up for us to take the lead was actually mm -hmm. uh, I don't even remember the play of the play exact play name or not, but it was 60 downtown A and Brad Gaines ran a wheel route up the sideline, made an amazing catch down the sideline, ran it in for a touchdown. And uh, that was the only time we'd run the wheel route in combination with the with the downtown play that whole game. And uh, and like I told you, that was the one game where Coach Brown called every offensive play and probably three quarters of the at least the last three quarters of all the defensive snaps too. So mm -hmm. he had to have been mentally shot by the end of that game. I'm sure. And if memory serves, their their attempt was about a 58-yard kick mm -hmm. into the tunnel. Yes. And, but I, I swear the wind had to have impacted because when that ball left the foot, I'm like, oh, oh yeah, I thought it was, I thought in. it was going through, but it it fell about a foot two feet short. So yeah. Thank goodness we we held them where we did. All right. So I think it's the same year or maybe the following year we play at West Point in the snow in November. Probably my favorite road trip of all time. As I told the story already about, you know, us and the Keystone Cops going to a four or five star restaurant and <laughs> all the managers and all we had to drive was the equipment truck. So the keystones are in the front and all the managers in the back and we pull up to the valet and hear all these guys pile out of the back of a, a U-Haul truck. So I'm sure they're thinking, what in the world are these bunch of hicks from Tennessee doing? But just the experience of getting to see West Point, see the, see the cadets coming in, you know, the long gray line as they call it. And then, even Friday, we got to tour the campus a little bit and see the chapel where once graduation happens, they have a wedding every 30 minutes after graduation because they obviously they can't get married while they're in the academy. Yeah. But it's booked that whole day and the next day for weddings every 30 minutes straight through. Billy said it was the Mark restaurant. He, yep, I had forgotten the name, but he is absolutely correct. But I will never forget the look on that valet's face when... <laughs> Uh, Danny, Gentry, Danny, Danny Gentry was driving and pitched him the keys and said, park it someplace safe for me, please. <laughs> All right, Tyler's just joined us. We'll see if he remembers some of these stories. How about big Cedric Moore breaking David Smith's collarbone oh, at home? I mean, that at was one of those battle. times where you, I'm, I'm watching it, and it's like it's in slow motion. You know, I can see that Cedric's got a bead on him, and I can see that him being left-handed, he's going to try to have to turn. And when he turns, he's going to be face-on with Cedric and having 15, 20-yard head start to get up a complete head of steam. And I, that is probably one of the most wicked hits I've ever seen in person in my life. Cedric put everything he had into it and – you know, that was before quarterback got, you know, protected yeah. and were, and he just absolutely drove him to and through the turf and pretty sure he broke his collarbone, if I remember right. The the only more defined definitive hit that I recall seeing in person is when Biscuit hit Burline in Legion Field the year before. Yep, I remember that hit too. Mm. All right, let me take you to – the game probably during my uh, time I was in school, the best win that we had. It was the worst uniform choice that we had. <laughs> you know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, the yellow uniforms for Florida. I think we were like the Raython 
game of the morning or something. Yes, Sim, it was uh, early in the eleven uh, thirty game. Smith, Emmett Smith was on the team but didn't play. Didn't or if he did, he didn't play well. No, he did not play well. He did not play that game. He said he, he was out with an injury. And but, their quarterback uh, the, who ended up – the backup quarterback who ended up playing pro baseball was the quarterback that day, and I, I'm drawing a blank right now. Oh. Um, and our defense uh, played so uh, well. Well, that and the other star of that game was Sean Guerin. Mm -hmm. He ran up and down the field. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, they had they had no answer for the wishbone that day. They they couldn't figure it out. They couldn't stop the dive, and we just kept running it. And I think Sean had close to 150, 160 yards during that game. And you know, in addition to what the other backs had, so you know, we controlled the clock for the most games because or most of the game because we were able to run the ball so well, and you know, just completely took them out of their game and out of their element, but actually the yellow uniforms were supposed to have made an appearance the game prior, but they had, they didn't come in from Russell in time. Mm -hmm. So we got them in for the Wednesday night before that game. So that's when we, we knew coach Brown told us to go in the locker for, to be prepared to switch jerseys at before uh, the game started after you, cause didn't we, go out in one color and you came back in, they were in the locker room. I don't remember. To a different Ty color. Tyler, do you remember if we switched uniforms between pregame and game? All right, I got two more for you. Oh, Herbert Perry. That's who the quarterback was. Thank you, Tyler. Yep. All right. It was 87 at Tennessee. Oh. We're up 28 to three and a half, largely because Billy Cunningham took one of Jeff Francis's passes to the house, but it was the second half that we just had a total collapse. What do you remember uh, about that game? The first thing I remember, and it was kind of the the end the UT Ole Miss game this year reminded me of it as when they were showing on TV when uh, the coach was leaving the field and the guy throws a water bottle and he catches it and then throws his hat up to him as he's leaving the stadium during the Ole Miss game. Sorry, I'm drawing a blank on the Ole Miss's coach's name for just for a second right now. Kiffin. Kiffin, thank you. Yeah, Kiffin catches the water bottle, but that little outcropping there, that's yeah. it wasn't it wasn't covered even back during I or why why it's not covered now, I don't know. Yeah. But I mean back when we played, we were coming off the field at halftime. There were batteries. Yeah, we didn't have the we didn't have the luxury of a helmet. So you know yeah. there were nine volt batteries golf balls whiskey, whiskey bottle, bottle yeah. cups cups of water cups of beer you know cups with whatever mixture they were drinking yeah. and you know, it was so why they haven't ever covered that little section to me is just negligence and then you know to add insult to injury or intention end up getting beat in the second half yeah. and we go back to the locker room there's no hot water in the showers. They left us about, brought us about 25 towels, but mm -hmm. thankfully Luke and uh, Kelly had thought ahead of time. So they brought about an extra hundred towels of our own, mm -hmm. but uh, that was just typical treatment that you got in Knoxville from not only their fans, but from, uh, from their support staff, mm -hmm. very poor. You know, Alabama, they were first class. Georgia was first class, Auburn was always first class, you know, as far as how the other equipment staffs and facility staffs treated us. But Tennessee was always, you know, the way it, the way it, the way it looked on that old Miss game. And frankly, I was really disappointed, you know, having spent some time in the SEC office that the SEC only gave them the amount of fine they did, the same fine that they gave Arkansas and Texas A&M for people running on the field. To me, that – that fine, you know, money, money at that level, you know, that amount at that level is it's not punitive. Yeah. The SEC needed to send a message and send a punitive, send a, set a punitive fine. It should have been, it should have started at a million dollars. Yeah. And then for the UT administration to only say, well, people that are going to be caught, you're going to lose your privileges for the rest of this year. You know, that should have been lifetime ban. Yeah. In my opinion. I mean, that's the way it is in the NFL league and most other SEC schools. If you're caught throwing stuff on, your your rights are revoked. Guys, I want to welcome. Oh, we got number seven. 
Tom Fitz has joined us. Hey, Tom, thank you, bud. It's been a while. Talking, of course, with Dwayne Jones. We've got a, it's our well, second. Beating, the, beating the ball and getting him a jump shot while he's on. That's right. That's right. Well, I got one more game. I'm going to take you to 86. I think we may have briefly talked about this. This is at Alabama. It's early September. You got Biscuit and Derek Thomas for Mark Ratcher. The, they run out of, of ice up in the upper deck where all of our families and friends are sitting. I mean, and the bathrooms weren't working, if I remember right. correctly. Right. It was, it was not a good day. But Coach Shep says, let me get to that. Where is it? I can't scroll back that far. I think he picked up the uniforms and brought them to the game. Does that sound we right? Had to, we had to stop on our way to the Alabama game because we had a – spring rehearsal game and it was it was a beautiful uniform it was a light gold color mm -hmm. and the names on the back were written in white kind of like i think one of our uniforms this year were yes, and coach white. kramer uh radio gets on the telephone down the sidelines and said hey guys we got a problem i can't read the numbers or the name plates on the jerseys so we had to order new uniforms to be made within less than 10 days for our whole team. And we literally picked them up Friday night at the Russell factory and then brought them back down to Tuscaloosa to get ready for the game. Was this, wait, was this the Russell factory down in Alex city? Mm -hmm. So that's a few hours South of Birmingham. So we're talking yes. three to four hours from Tuscaloosa. Yeah. So after, after, pra after practice on Friday, we loaded up Kelly and I, and uh, one of the other managers got in a car and uh, drove our van and drove down, drove to Russell to pick up the, the uniforms so that we had, but we had our, as an alternative, we had our home uniform and, you know, we're, going to have to ask Alabama if our uniforms weren't ready, if they would be willing to swap to wearing their road uniforms and let us wear our. Uh, Could you imagine the outcry had that happened? Oh, we would have really gotten blistered. Oh my God. But, you know, conference rules. And, you know, at that time, the equipment managers were a pretty tight group and, you know, they would have, you know, the equipment manager would have talked into it the head coach. I don't know if that would have, uh, gone over as well but that's what the alternative plan was if we didn't get those uniforms ready well Dwayne, we, we've got a few more minutes but i want to i want to get back to vanderbilt and tradition i want to get back to what it means to you and your family about being part of that tradition I, i'm not i'm not as concerned historically about wins and losses that that really is not no that's you know, about those to are, me and many sure i would have i would have absolutely loved to have for us to you know to be a, a program that wins and you know is nationally recognized but vanderbilt's about family you know and here's a, a great example of that i sent i sent you the picture and you put it up on the group photo the other a couple of weekends ago my brother's uh son it goes to donaldson christian and they're playing Jeff Brothers Nashville Christian team and there were probably 12 or 15 Vanderbilt football players that showed up for the game we had Kenny Pruss Kenny Pulse uh Steve Meads and of course Jeff Brothers was there Beverly was there Luke and his wife were there I was there Brad and Chris Gaines and Greg Gaines and you know to see that kind of kind of Vanderbilt community coming just to you know because they know that hey we're going to be some some bandy guys here let's let's all go support each other and you know go out and support a local high school game is a great game end up dca won seven to three but uh you know i think it we may see each other uh you know later on in the in the state championship game if everything goes the way it should mm -hmm. but that that to me sums up what vanderbilt is about you know guys that were teammates coming together saying hey you know here's a chance for us all to get together and you know reminisce and you know they came my jody sets up a huge tailgate before the game so all the guys came out and tailgated and jeff even stopped in for a few minutes before his team went out on the field and was talking with everybody and then was kind enough to stop for that photo at the end with jody and uh, steve meads there before they got on the bus 
really, you know, to me, that's what separates Vanderbilt from other schools is that brotherhood and sense of family that we had amongst, you know, teammates and, you know, and that's the other thing is this Facebook group has done, you know, not only has it brought us together that went to school together, even others that we didn't go together with now I've gotten to know very well and looking forward to seeing some guys. Matter of fact, Kenny Hammond invited me down to the Valley head for a weekend to come have barbecue chicken and play golf. So nice. we'll see who see, we'll see whose hundred score is higher, mine or his. <laughs> you know, that's, I love, I love that response. And I, and I, I figured that's where you would go. And I bet during that game in between the, the, the stress of how close that game was, I bet there were a lot of laughs shared, a lot of memories. Oh, it was, you know. Some, was... some of which may actually be true. <laughs> yeah, we had we had a linebacker that's not real good, and uh, he ended up intercepting a pass and taking it deep down into their territory, and Brad turned around and said, had to have been a water boy deal. It's had to have stuck in his face mask. There's no way he caught that ball. <laughs> but the the linebacker is the high school coach, is the high school principal's son. So he's untouchable as far as taking off the field. But mm -hmm. uh, thankfully we've got another linebacker that's really good that uh, you know I think will probably play college ball. So for a small school, they've got four or five kids that can play at some level of college, whether it be D1 or you know, Trebekah, not Trebekah, I meant uh, Austin P, Tennessee, Tennessee Tech, Eastern Kentucky, some of those schools. And I've had Coach Shepard's helping me get uh, Austin P to look at some of the kids there. He's, I reached out to him. So just trying to help those guys get, get a chance to get into some colleges. Because that's the one thing that Coach Shepard brought up that I hadn't even thought of with the transfer portal. Now there are fewer high school kids getting offered because coaches are holding scholarships for transfer for guys. Well, that, that is, that is definitely one of the, if not many factors, good or bad to deal with transfer portal, but we, we'll have to, we'll have to shelve that topic for another day too. But here, here's what, what I want to leave you with, or I want you to leave us uh, with Dwayne is we've heard lots of changes are already in the process for football, basketball, probably baseball, when I mean changes, internal structures, facilities, whatever it may be, an awesome commitment by the administration, $300 million uh, projects of what they've announced. And I, I suspect in the upcoming weeks and months, we'll learn more of what those specifics are gonna look like. But as someone who's been part of the program for more than four decades now, sorry to age you, but what is it that you hope to see, not just from a physical structure change, but from within the athletics department going forward for all of these programs? Well, not so much from the athletics, more from the university side. You know, the fact that they are now willing to acknowledge us and that we are a part of the university and that we deserve the right to be supported financially. I mean, heavens with the new SEC package with Oklahoma and Texas coming in, they're getting ready to get a hundred million dollar check a year. So it's nice to see that they're letting us use that money. So I'm anxious to see some, some dirt moved and some concrete poured and some buildings put up rather than, you know, the last 40 years we've been given carpet. Well, I thought you were, I thought you were talking about changes mentally by the administration with concrete <laughs> board and mid chain. You're talking about physical strength. Go ahead. Yeah. But yeah, and also, you know, the administration, you know, actually coming out and publicly stating, you know, that, hey, we're here's we're here's here's our goal. Here's where we're starting out with. Here's what we're investing initially. And that's the first time in my 40 years that I've ever heard yeah. the university itself say, hey, athletic department, y'all need help. And it's time for us to step up and show you that uh, we're, we're there to support you. And that that. For, you know, as a lifelong Vanderbilt fan, that's the biggest, just being acknowledged that you are a part of the university and you have been ignored, but you do need support from them in order to succeed and be competitive. And I'm hoping in a couple of months when Chancellor Deermeyer comes on this show, he'll further that answer. He'll show us or tell us what's what we can look forward to. So 
I'm, I'm, I'm very positive. I'm, I'm still as optimistic as I was earlier in the season when Co or a year ago when Coach was named. And like you said earlier, you know, they've shown improvement throughout the year. You know, they've gotten better and they, you know, they're getting thinner, but they're still playing in, in number wise. But, you know, they're still playing hard. They're playing competitive. And, you know, we've had two or three chances to, to pull out a win, just, you know, one bad decision or one, you know, special teams play not work out just right and it turns around and you know cost us a game but you know we oh, were competitive they were there to, to win it Dwayne this should be a five and four team right now not a yes two and easily yeah you know with with one decision and uh one one possession they are a five and four team yeah. well buddy you're you're a five and four team in my book every year <laughs> I'll take five and fours and win the record anytime that's right. That's right. Well, Dwayne, I always love these talks. I love how much you're committed to our group and contributing. You've got more memory stored up there in your head than most folks will, will forget. So thank you for, for just being part of all this. This is awesome. Thank well, you. Again, thank you for giving us this forum where we can all get together and share our stories. And then one time I, you know, I would question I would like to ask, you know, because somebody had it and it was a newspaper article. You know, as college players, when you know you're not going to pro that last game, when you take those pads off for the last time, what that feeling is. But we'll save that for our next show. Yeah, we'll talk about that another time because I do have some memories, some specific memories about that. My last is that game, something as a you know, as a guy that didn't get to wear the pads would would love to hear y'all your insight and you know other other players' insights and so you know, emotionally and what that was like and mentally what that was like to know that I'm never going to do this again. You know, it's not like golf or tennis or, you know, basketball where you can go play, you can still go play a game. You're, you're never going to put on pads and play a football game again. Well, it was 1989, 17 to 10 loss to Tennessee. I still remember almost that whole game. Anyway, guys, this will conclude us for another week of conversations with Commodores. Anchor, Anchor down. down. Let's get some folks in the stands on Saturday. Yes, sir. Take care. Thank you, man.